Investor Ideas in Bogota, Colombia, and I'm here today at the 13th Andean Congress of Contact Centers and Customer Relationship Management, otherwise known as 13 Congreso Andino. I'm here today with Scott Koloski, an expert that is going to give us a glimpse of the future of the sector and how technology is changing its role. For the average retail investor, what would you suggest in terms of resources or where to go to, to get a sense of that future and really educate themselves? So it's a good question. We, we talk about um, building rivers of information into your brain. So on the internet today, there's a huge amount of information floating around every single day. So you have to use tools that harvest that information and then read it every day. And that's what we call building a river of information. So for me, I have, let's say, five blogs that get pushed to my email every day. And I read those every day. I have video blogs that get pushed to my phone and I listen to them every time I get a moment to listen to them. Uh, I have people that are experts around me that I follow everything that they do and say. So I have carefully picked out a number of sources of information that I digest, I read every day. And this keeps me extremely current on what's going on. Oh, TechCrunch. I mean, I, I read TechCrunch every day, obviously, but uh, Altimeter, I read anything Altimeter puts out. Uh, I read uh, oh, two or three of the, the blogs about social technologies like Mashable, right? So those, but then, then there's certain people, uh, bloggers that I just, you know, I particularly like some of the things that they say. And not always people that are technologists. You know, sometimes it's people that are just, you know, philo philosophical about things in life. Uh, that I'll follow. So, so that, that's I, I, we've been doing this actually for four or five years. We've been teaching clients how to build these rivers of information, it's so that we up your IQ, what, what we call the industry IQ, and it's pretty powerful. It's a long story of what we've been doing, but it's all about how do you concentrate knowledge uh, by using the internet t uh, information flow today. So, as you describe leaders as either high beam or low beam. With the uh, environment that we have right now, um, you're seeing a lot in politics where we question the high beam leaders, and I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Do you have any examples of politicians globally anywhere that you think really see into the future and are thinking 15, 20 years out instead of just the term of their election? Wow. <laughs> you know, the tough thing about this is, I, I mean, I almost have to say no you know, to, to this because I've been very disappointed for the last decade at how slow politicians are to use technology in their countries to give their countries an advantage. Uh, I will tell you that uh, Malaysia seems to be doing a pretty good job. South Korea has done a good job. Uh, Ireland lately has done a good job. Uh, you know, I, I won't pick out specific leaders there, but just to tell you, their governments uh, seem to be doing a pretty good job of understanding how to leverage some aspect of technology. In Ireland, it was a low tax base and good manufacturing, right? In, in South Korea, it's really good infrastructure. The government's, in, 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 you know, invested in infrastructure. Where in the U.S., the government doesn't invest in infrastructure very well. They let it, leave it to companies to do all that. So, uh, I, I could tell you, I've been very disappointed in the U.S. You know, I, there are other countries around the world, when I go to those countries, I look around and think, you know, they're, they are advancing faster with technology than, than we are. Uh, and that, that really upsets me. But, you know, I, I would say in general, I'm unhappy that politicians don't seem to have a sense of this digital transformation. And they don't have a sense that things like, well, high bandwidth speeds could really help my people, right? Having free internet for everybody in my country could make an unbelievable difference. Like, those things to me are so basic. And yet the politicians will, they'll spend a lot of time and energy on other things instead of trying to make sure everyone's got an internet connection. Which just, you know, that this is idiotic. And, and on that note, um, you know, a lot of political kids are going out trying to get votes. They talk about jobs, 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 and everything on that basis is transforming as we've talked about. So, uh, I know you just talked about it a little bit with the other journalists, but do you see like a hierarchy from responsibility from government to corporation to individual or the reverse, individual corporation to government? Because there's people that get terrified when, they're, when their job's at risk, but there should be a forewarning. We shouldn't be all in shock when we lose our job anymore because things are changing so rapidly. 
All right, so excellent question. It depends a little bit on what your form of government is, but I would say my belief would be individual corporations, government would be the order. But, you know, I worked in the Soviet Union in the late 80s, okay, well, if it's a socialist nation, you know, then you're going to say individual government, and there was no corporations. So it depends a little bit on the form of government, but set that argument aside. Uh, I absolutely think individuals have to take responsibility for being relevant. I mean, you have to look around and make yourself relevant. You are the first ones responsible. In other words, if you are a manufacturing person who put a nut on a bolt all day long, and now you're mad because a robot does that, I'm sorry, you should have looked around and come up with a different uh, thing to do, but you know, it's the same thing when I look at other jobs that I know I can tell are going to go away. I'm just wondering why these people aren't already trying to figure out you know, what would be a different career. So I think individual first. Uh, companies second, you know, we, there, we, there's this debate about what is the moral responsibility of companies. So if you're going to shrink your workforce and raise your technology, what, what moral and ethical responsibilities do you have right, to try to handle people in the right way or to retrain them or to outplace them you know, well? So I think companies have that responsibility. And then you know, the last one would be governments. And I think government is all about retraining and training programs. You know, I mentioned to you Malaysia. I saw one day the amount of money that Malaysia spends on training people. And I don't know if you've ever looked at this. They don't have unemployment there. They don't pay unemployment. Like in the US, we pay unemployment benefits. They don't pay unemployment benefits in Malaysia, from what I've heard. They take all that money and they put it into training programs. Yes, and so what they say to people is, oh, if you're unemployed, we have a free training program over here for you. This is brilliant. You know, this is the way governments have to be thinking. I look at the US, for instance, uh, Donald Trump, who says, oh, well, we need to tariff everything coming out of China so we can move manufacturing jobs back to the US. Like, this is insane. It, it, well, we don't need manufacturing jobs in the U.S. I'm fine with letting other countries do manufacturing jobs. We need technology jobs, right? Why don't you grow technology jobs? Um, the other thing is, um, I've had some experiences with Facebook where I literally could not speak to a human being, and it drove me crazy because no matter what I did, I couldn't get through to a human being. So my question is, with a big company like that, that seems to have no human element whatsoever, and, and I can't quit Facebook because it's too big to quit, but if it was a smaller company, I would go somewhere else. So what do you say to a company that doesn't recognize the value of the human element in that? Well, I don't agree with it, first of all. Uh, I guess you could argue that that's my age, right? But, but I would argue it from a humology standpoint that you know, it, they have found the wrong balance. I was talking to uh, uh, somebody who does customer care for Dollar Shave Club, you know, which is growing like crazy in the U.S. So the young lady who runs their customer care told me that they have no phone system in their company at all. No phones on desks at all. And she said they're a new company and they asked the question, well, why do we need phones? I mean, if somebody wants us, they can message us. And so they literally have no phone system. So, so it, I'm like, oh, well, you know, as long as there's other ways I could Skype you or right, some way I could talk to you, maybe I'd feel okay. But I, I guess what I would say is I, I think we're having examples, like I gave the airlines, of companies moving too far into the team. And I think that they will have consequences, you know, for moving too far into the technology side. You know, companies have, there, there still needs to be a human element. You know, even Amazon, you can get somebody on Amazon if you need to. You can get a rep on the phone if you need to, right? They don't, it isn't necessarily simple, but, but and they don't want you to do it, but you can do it. And, and my last question is, with your, you cite crowdscribe.com, you're, you know, uh, matching authors and trying to get people to fund authors. Uh, just a question in, in terms of your presentation, you said there's no books or movies out there that are, you know, presenting the utopian view of technology. It's all dark. Have you thought about hosting a contest to maybe uh, incite that or inspire that? I haven't. It's a good idea. I, I, it, it, that thought has been bothering me a lot the last few months, and uh, I've been talking to other people about it because I'll mention it from stage, and people will talk to me about it, about it. It is psychologically interesting that as a human race, we only can see a dark future, and why is that? Why are we that negative? And then I'm starting to ask the question much more: of What does the utopian future look like? And I'm seeing more and more people writing articles now about what a utopian future might look like, uh, which I which I think is fantastic. I, 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 it isn't so much I thought about a contest, but I really have thought about someday I'd like to give a speech on the utopian future. And it's the opposite of the Matrix and the opposite of the Terminator. And now all I do is paint a picture of what a utopian future will look like, but it's realistic. Right? I'm not dreaming. It's I'm extrapolating trends and showing 
how it could be a wonderful future. Uh, you know, it's like, I would like to give that speech because I, I'm tired of us being innovated with everything being post-apocalyptic, everything being dark, everything, you know, technology takes over our lives. As opposed to, we learn how to harness technology to do the work for us so that we're doing 90% less work than we do today, but we still, we still have wealth and money. Yes. Great, thank you. All right, good questions.